I actually got arrested twice in 24 hours in New Orleans. I, I went down there for Mardi Gras and I see this big Irish cop and I go up to him and I say, hey, what, what can I actually get busted for here? I, I, I want to stay out of trouble. He says, don't piss in my streets and don't fight my streets. So under the influence of a lot of uh, hurricanes and beers and some ecstasy and coke, what two things do you think this knucklehead got arrested for? Welcoming to Knocking Doors Down, great champion. How are you, good sir? I'm wonderful, Jason. How you doing, Mikey? It's great doing to be well. here. I'm so glad you guys invited me onto your podcast. Yes, uh, you know, of course, Greg, a little bit of a background. Uh, you, you know, you're a branding expert working with top consumer brands, major television networks, professional sports teams, all that over the last 15 years. But of course, the thing that uh, maybe most proud of over 20 years now in recovery and sobriety. Yeah, I just this past November, I celebrated uh, 26 years sober. My, wow, my sobriety congrats. dates 11, 7, 1994. And you know, guys, in sobriety, we learn to keep things simple. So when it was time to marry my wife, my my marriage date is seven eleven. So I, I so, so you know that way I won't forget the two most important dates in my in my in my life. So, mm. but uh, thank you for that uh, acknowledgement. And um, yeah, I mean, I I uh, had a nice career in, in Hollywood. Um, I, I worked my way up from a PA to a writer to a to an associate producer to an executive producer. Um, owned my own company for a while. My, my clients at the time were Doritos and Barbie and Gap. Um, and all of it I owe to sobriety because um, two years into my sobriety in Hollywood, um, I, I sort of came up with a mantra called shifting addiction to passion. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what I felt was I was in my mid twenties and a lot of my friends were still drinking and using. And so they would say, let's go out on Thursday night. Let's go out on Thursday night. And you know what? I would stay in. And I would work on my scripts or I'd work on my pitches. And then on Saturday mornings, by us being sober, guess what? We have the gift of not being hung over, right? Right, right? So I would get into the office at eight in the morning and I would use um, the, the company's printing machines and their computers to print out my scripts and mailing. And so basically, guys, in a very short amount of time, I would take those four hours on Thursday nights and those four hours on Saturday mornings. And if you do that 52 weeks, you're going to have a company built. You're going to have a brand built. You're going to have some scripts sold. And that's what I felt was my magic was, was I was able to, to, to use the hours I used to waste with drugs and alcohol and shift that, those hours to my passion, which was creativity and, and writing and sort of climbing the ladder in the Hollywood game. Yeah, it's, awesome. it's interesting you talk about that, Greg, because I know for me, um, once I started to get more long-term into sobriety, I noticed more dollars and cents in my bank account. And ironically, having um, uh, remembering moments where, you know, I was feeling that bad for booze that I was counting change because that's all I had in my bank account was at zero and going into the store and counting it out so I could get two tall cans or whatever else it was. And, um, you know, this morning, I'm now I'm checking my investment portfolio and seeing not dollars and cents, but thousands of dollars and cents, you know, and uh, really changing yeah. that mentality to to build something because, um, you know, you're a prime example of that, uh, you know, like you said, the wife, a family man, uh, three kids? Two, two girls. Two girls. Okay. That's awesome. Um, so, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I didn't have the same view when I was in Hollywood because I was deep into the party. <laughs> so I woke up many days more than not hungover or, you know, looking for another bag. And another unfortunate, Charlie Sheen himself told me we're kind of screwed in the Hollywood game if we have tattoos. So that was kind of a shot. <laughs> <laughs> he said, stay off the crack and stay off the tattoos. And I was like, well, I'm off crack. Yeah, but no, no, no pipe, no ink. Yeah. Uh, well, let's talk about how you even got into uh, your addiction. I, I find it all, Greg, that I don't know about the countless of people that you work with. I know for me, a lot of it related to my childhood. Yeah. Um, Jason, 100%. There, there's a great um, wise doctor up in Canada named Dr. Gabor Maté. And uh, if you guys don't know him, please look him up. He, he really does say, it comes down to this, that, that if, you, if you show me an addict, I show you someone who's had childhood trauma. Mm -hmm. You know, there's some sort of trauma or pain that happened along the way. And so if you guys allow me to tell my story and I'll try to tell it as fast as I can, but um, it really started when I was four and a half years old. Um, my father was killed in a drunk on drunk car crash. And so I woke up that morning and, you know, to, to not having a father. Um, and I felt different. 
Um, I, I, I was being raised by a single mom. All the other kids had dads. There was two cars in the garages. There certainly is a financial element by having a, a mom bring in income in the 70s and 80s. Yeah. Um, and so I felt that. And, and um, so for that being five years old, six years old, seven years old, this is how I dealt with it. I, I, I got great grades because I, if I couldn't beat you by not having a dad, I'm going to show you having a great grades. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also fairly good on the athletic field. So I was going to beat you there. I was the fastest kid in my class, you know, and you know, the fastest kid always gets picked first or second, no matter what the sport is. Right. right. But here's the, here's the scary part, guys. I, I was a bully. I used violence. Um, I know Jason's like you, <laughs> no, <laughs> I, I, but, that, but, but that's, that's, I had to get my rage out. I, I sure. thought life was unfair. And um, so I had those three things swirling around for me. And, and what's crazy is um, I found out that I love shortcuts. And so I ended up in the, um, the uh, principal's office a lot. And I would, they would say, hey, Greg, I need you to write 200 times. I will not talk in class. And so on the chalkboard, I would write, I, 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 whoa, 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 no, 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 talk in class, right? And the thing is, I'm doing the work, but I'm not getting the message, you know? And, and, and that, that followed me for a long time, being a shortcut guy who was doing the work, but not getting the message. Mm -hmm. um, before we got on today, Eric, I mean, I'm sorry, Jason, you alluded to childhood trauma. I had, I had some sexual abuse when I was eight, nine years old. A, a neighbor took advantage and, um, and my body went into shock. You know, um, I was confused. Um, I was uh, full of shame, full of shame. And, um, and so I, I, and what I want to say to men that are out there, email me, text me, text Jason, we will talk to you. I think that the power of, of getting rid of that shame, Jason and Mikey is putting your hand in the air and telling your story. Yeah. Um, what happened for me is I kept that in for a long, long time. And what helped me was um, I happen to know a famous boxer by the name of Sugar Ray Leonard, who <laughs> yeah. is, who is sober, who's sober. He is a prince of a man. And I remember one day I'm, I'm in, a, in a meeting and he raises his hand and he tells his story of a coach being, uh, uh, being inappropriate with him. And I look over there and I go, well, if the champ can tell a story, I can tell my story. Sure. And so I went over to Ray and I said, Ray, can we do breakfast? And we went out to breakfast and I said, Ray, I have not told this story in my whole adult life, but I'm going to tell it to you because you just told yours. And by telling him, I've been able to tell it to everybody because I want someone to put their hand in the air and go, it wasn't my fault, right? I shouldn't feel shame. And there's solutions of how to get out of that because I know for a fact that part of my drinking and drugging was keeping those secrets down. You could not find out about that stuff. And so I would, you know, get to the keg or I would get to the, the bong or I'd get to the, the line of Coke and I would just medicate out. Um, and then um, my mom remarried um, when I was 10 years old and she married a guy who was a World War II vet. He was uh, there on D-Day. So if you've seen Saving Private Ryan, he is, he's that, he's yeah. that guy, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, and they're called the greatest generation for a reason, right? Yes. And, um, and so uh, his name is Walt Janicki. He um, took the GI Bill, went to Northwestern, and he got a, a degree in engineering. He um, married my mom. And here's the best part. He loved my mom. And I needed someone to love my mom. Right. Yeah. Yes, and, um, absolutely. Cause I love my mom. <laughs> right. so, too, man. I'm a so, huge uh, mama's boy myself. Yeah, right. So yeah. Absolutely. So yeah. Mama's boys all the way I, around here. Yeah. Hey, I, I'm a mama's boy. You guys, we're mama's boys. Who can't, you know, yeah. I'll, I'll see you out in the alley if you have any problem with that. Um, yeah, so, sure. um, sure. and so, and here's the other cool thing is he, he taught me how to tie a tie, shave my face, open doors for women. And he brought 17 years of AA sobriety into our home, oh, you, you know, and that was great. And I loved having a dad. He showed up for my football games and my little league games. I mean, it was, it was great, but then 13 happened. And I don't know about you, but I know many of us took our first drink or drug right around 12 or 13, 14 years old. And I certainly fell into that group. And so all of a sudden I'm living in San Diego. I'm right next to Tijuana. And all of a sudden we got fake IDs and we started going across the border to Tijuana. And here I was a 13, 14, 15 year old pretending to be an adult, right? right. 
Yeah. And I was doing, I was drinking a lot, smoking a lot of pot and doing a lot of cocaine, chasing girls. And guess what? My grades went down. Being a great athlete wasn't no longer a priority. I just wanted to show you that I was the best drinker. Or I could blow the, I could blow the biggest bong hit or do the longest line, right? Yeah. Stupid, stupid achievements that I wanted, right? And um, again, the disease of alcoholism and the disease of addiction had taken over. But again, Monday through Friday, I went to school and it's only showed up on Sat Fridays and Saturday nights, like most high school kids, right? Yeah, 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 very much so. So then it was time for me to choose a um, college. And um, while I have a pretty high IQ, I certainly only had C's to get me into college. <laughs> and, 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 and one college took me. Um, and you may know of it. Um, it's probably the Arizona's version of Chico State. It's called Arizona State University. <laughs> Ironically, I went there in 96, so I know. Okay, so Jason, so we are, we are brothers, brothers yep. in arms. Um, and, and, and back then, you know, actually ASU is a very good school these days. They have, they have a great entrepreneurial program, um, a lot of foundations uh, and, and, and scholarships. Um, I know they're doing good work, but back in the 80s, it was the number one party school in the country. And I went there because guess what? It was guys like you that were there. You know, yeah. people who like to party, people who like to, to, you know, spend their parents' credit cards and do debauchery and go to class only half the time, right? And so I, I got out of there uh, with a degree in broadcast journalism. It took me five years um, <laughs> to get out. Um, and, but what's really scary is we're taught in America that, um, that once you get out of college, it's, you enter the real world, you know? Right. And, and, and I did, I entered the real world and it happened for me the, my, my graduation night, I got my first DUI. Ooh. And, um, and I, I, I barely made it to the graduation ceremony the next day. You know, my parents had no idea. I had some guys bail me out. Um, but over the next two years, I got arrested seven other times for a total of eight times in two years. And, um, and, um, the charges were varying. They were um, another drunk driving, driving with a suspended license. I actually got arrested twice in 24 hours in New Orleans. I, I went sure. down there for Mardi Gras and I see this big Irish cop and I go up to him and I say, hey, what, what can I actually get busted for here? I, I, I wanna stay out of trouble. He says, don't piss in my streets and don't fight in my streets. So under the influence of a lot of uh, hurricanes and beers and some ecstasy and coke, what two things do you think this knucklehead got arrested for? You fought somebody and then pissed, <laughs> pissed on them. in the streets. <laughs> uh, shit. So, Go so fighting and pissing. <laughs> and so, remember, I told you that the, the the shortcuts was part of my story. And and yeah. so, um, when I got in, when I got my first job, I was working at a local TV station, and I was working overnights. You know, six p.m. to three a.m. And, and you, Jason, I know you have a radio background. You, you once had that shift. I know it, right? Sounds, sounds familiar. Yeah. Sounds familiar, right? Yeah. It so, was the, was the, the 10 a.m. Uh, or 10 p.m. We had to do a love line live. So you couldn't uh, switch it. Ironically, a person that totally fell into drinking uh, heavily listened five nights a week to Dr. Drew and Adam Carolla talk to people about drugs and addiction and everything else. But yeah, it was that, that, t that 10 p.m. to like 3, 3 a.m. in the morning. Yep. And, um, and so it paid me $19,000 a year. And I was like, wait a minute, you guys promised me a six figure income if I went and got a college degree, right? Where yeah. is that? I'm, I'm still, I'm still eating top ramen and drinking Mountain Dew, you know, you know? And so um, uh, as we all know that at 3 AM um, our, our legitimate friends are all in bed, you know, living normal lives, but our lower companions are out there. Yeah. And I found my lower companions at 3 AM and um, they suggested, Hey, you, you went to college. I said, yeah. You said, you must have a lot of friends on the East Coast. I do. Well, why don't we start shipping some um, uh, marijuana out to your friends in DC and Boston and Connecticut? And I've always had the entrepreneurial spirit. So I chalked this up as an entrepreneurial spirit uh, type deal. And we went from two pounds to eight pounds to 16 pounds to eventually 50 pounds per load. And, um, and I ended up getting busted in the airport with 50 pounds a pot. And here was a kid who um, went to private Catholic school, had a college degree, had greatest generation parents. You know, uh, Mikey uh, asked me about it. Or last name was Champion, and and I and I'm I'm a fucking drug dealer. Yeah. You know, I'm I'm a loser drug dealer, and I'm gonna be I'm gonna embarrass my parents with my headline in the newspaper. 
And um, more so, I got in front of this judge and he says, hey, I'm looking at you. You seem like a pretty decent kid. What happened? And I think all of us would agree. I uttered these three words. I don't know. The Knocking Doors Down Autobiography by Carlos Vieira. It takes you deep into his destructive past and how racing saved his life and opened the door to give back to the community. And 100% of the sales go directly to the Carlos Vieira Foundation, an organization committed to raising awareness for addiction, mental health, and autism. And for inspiration and motivation, tune in weekly to the podcast every Thursday for real-life episodes from celebrities and local heroes. Get Knocking Doors Down today at kddmediacompany.com or Amazon. I don't know because when I was drug dealing guys, I had to drink six double cranberry and vodkas. I had to do two lines of Coke, a couple uh, hits off the bong. I had to be so medicated to get on that plane because I had so much shame. Yeah. You know, what, what is a good kid doing this? You know, yeah. but, but I, I just couldn't under, I, I had to become that animal, you know? And, um, and I was this animal who went and did that and then tried to put up a good white picket fence per guy uh, during the daytime. Well, yeah. guess what? The universe is going to catch up with you because I don't know about you, but any drug leader I know, it ends in two ways, prison or death. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And it's interesting. So, you point that out yeah, there too, Greg, really talking about, um, uh, you know, people can hear it. We talked about it heavily in the Charlie Sheen episode and was very familiar to me where he talked about that playing different roles for different people, which sounds like, you know, you're doing, you're sober, you get up there in front of the judge, this one thing, the drug dealer, this one thing at work, this in front of your parents, it's, it's all these different roles that you're playing and none of it is truly you. Oh, it, it's, it, it's, you hit it right on the spot. I think one of the, the, the greatest gifts we can give ourselves in recovery is self-awareness. You, you have to be self-aware before you can take that, that embodiment out into the world. Um, and so I, I give you one little story. I used to meet my mom in Vegas, um, for a, a mother son weekend, right? And I can remember at eight o'clock, we'd go to the buffet. I would, I would eat spaghetti and garlic bread with her and drink milk, right? I'd tuck her in bed at nine o'clock and I and I would go on a all nighter, you know? And, um, and I, I, I was able to play that good son in front of her, but at night I was an animal, you know? So I get in front of this judge and he says to me, well, here's what I do know, son. If I see you in my courtroom in the next six months, I'm going to give you the five years hanging over your head. And um, so 18 days later, I'm in my little sports car driving around La Jolla. I'm on, I'm on my way to the party of the year. Um, and, and gentlemen, I think by now, you know, that I've lost all my high school friends by now, all my college friends. No one wants to be around this scumbag. And so I'm going to party of the year where I don't know anybody. Um, but I arrive with six beers in me. Um, a, a couple uh, joints that I've smoked along the way. And I have a couple, uh, this is old school word, guys, bindles of Coke in my pocket. <laughs> <laughs> Google it, kids. Google yeah. it. Uh, um, and I walk in and I see a guy like Mikey walk over to me 10 minutes in and, and, and he goes, hey, you got any blow on you? I'm a people pleaser. I, I, sure. Yeah, let's go down the stairs into my car. I pulled out my Duran Duran CD case, right? This is the early nineties. And guys, please don't judge my, my, my music. You know, um, <laughs> it, it, it's got some good stuff. I was oh, yeah, they do. And, 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 and you think about it, if, if, if it's the case you're using for Coke, you probably are not really into that album anyways, because you're, you're using, true. you know, you're, yeah. yeah true, true. So, um, and, um, and so I chop up a couple of lines. I, I present it like this and out of, out of his line of sight comes in, San Diego Police Department. Oh, and all of a sudden that demoralization that comes over us when once again, we have fucked up. We can cuss on here, can't we? Absolutely, yep. we do. Okay, <laughs> okay. <laughs> I guess I already did. Um, and, um, and, uh, and so what happens guys is I wake up the next morning in, in a jail cell on the cold floor. I'm in the fetal position and um and i know i'm done i i mean before you guys take a look at me i had blonde curly hair i was a rugged guy like like i i'm me in prison for five years is is, is i'm gonna be someone's pretty little girl for, for <laughs> you, know? <laughs> you know so you know i have you know, I, you know and I've, and I've watched enough prison movies to see what the hell goes down you know yeah, right, right. Um, so, so I, I'm really demoralized and, and, and all of a sudden I, I, I hear a voice in the cell go, Greg, there's a better way. 
Greg, there's a better way. And I, I open my eyes, I look around, there's no one around. And then the voice says, call your mother. Call my mother. I'm, I'm a big, bad drug dealer. The last person I'm going to call is my mother, my mommy, you know, mm -hmm. but more so I can't call my mom. She's in her sixties. She's retired. I, I can't tell her her son's going to go to, to uh, prison for five years. Right. And, um, and so I do call her though. And here's what she says. And, 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 and Mikey, I know that your mom calls you Michael. My mom calls me Gregory. You know, they always use the formal name, right? <laughs> Gregory? <laughs> Gregory? Surprisingly, I, I, no. I'm Mikey all the way around from everybody. That's okay. just because okay. you and your dad have the same name. We have the same okay. name. Got yeah. it. Okay. But I get what you're well, saying. But I get you get what you're saying. So yeah. Gregory, I, I want you to go to church. You want me to go to church? Yeah, yeah. I want you to go to church. And so I get bailed out. And at that night, uh, at six o'clock on a Sunday mass, I went to, to, to church and the priest says, hey, after mass, we're going to have confession. And uh, I have three priests over here and I have three priests over here. Pick a, pick a door and, and, and give your confession away. And here's my thinking, because again, I'm in animal mode. Right. Um, my thinking is this, if I go confess, I can go out tonight. Oh yeah, mm. sounds totally I can familiar. Go, I can go out tonight. And luckily I chose door number two and I went into this room and there was this beautiful older man. He kind of looked like Ronald Reagan with gray hair and he had lightning blue eyes and he had an Irish accent. I won't do an Irish accent for you because it'll be brutal. Oh, great, um, great. Go ahead and confess. Okay, Jason, how about you play the role? <laughs> All right. Tell, tell us your story there, lad. Yeah. Uh, uh, tell, tell me your sins. Give me, give me, give me. Yeah. Go ahead and tell me your sins. Tell me your sins, Gregory. Okay, perfect. So I say, <laughs> I say, I say, Father, um, when I smoke a lot of pot, I show up on Christmas on December 27th. When I uh, uh, drink a lot, I go into bars and I hurt people. And when I do a lot of cocaine, I date, I date three women at the same time and they have no idea I'm doing that. And when I do all three, I fly large amounts of marijuana to the East Coast. And he says, stop, stop, son. I said, why? He says, do you think you have a problem with drugs and alcohol? No. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know? <laughs> no, I because lost my mind, <laughs> right? Yeah, no, uh, you know, meanwhile, I, I've just looked back over the last two years and, and I've been arrested eight times. And the two things that are in common are Greg plus drugs and alcohol, right? <laughs> right, right, right. So, but, but, but that's, that's what we do. We lie. We're so quick to lie, you know, we're liars, we're cheaters, we're thieves. And, and so, but I, I did what we do and I, and I, and I do want to reference AA in here. Um, we do what we call an AA, the AA pause. I pause when agitated. And I said, father, it's so funny. You're the second man to ever ask me that question. He says, well, who was the first? And I said, my stepfather, he goes, what was your stepfather's name? I said, Walt Janicki. The priest leans over, grabs my hand. And he says, I was Walt Janicki's first sponsor. Wow. <laughs> Gave me the chills. Right, I, the camera can't pick that up, but <laughs> and, and, and guys, I've been telling that I've been telling that uh, story for 26 years, and every time I get to that moment, I tear up because I am so blessed by a higher power to create that moment for me to go, Greg. You better listen to what this guy tells you, or you're going to end up in the fucking grave, and it's yeah. that simple. And so, in this little confessional in this little church in San Diego, here's what he told me: He says, "Your sins don't belong here." They belong four blocks up at the Alano Club, and there happens to be an AA meeting starting at 7.30, and I think you should go. And so before I went, he gave me his phone number and a piece of paper. I put it in my pocket, went down that meeting, and I went, and that was 11-7-1994. I went to my first 12-step meeting. And, um, and, uh, and, and again, for those who don't know what goes on in there, th there's the plastic cakes, there's the chips, there's the yeah. holding of hands, there is um, the sharing. And, um, you know, I, I just sat there numb. Um, the next morning I went to his office and I, uh, and I opened up the piece of paper and his name is Father Bill Wilson. The same name as our founder of Alcoholics Anonymous. Huh. And that was just another God shot, as I like to call him, God shots to say, Greg, you're on the right path. And so Father Bill became my sponsor. He became my Eskimo. He told me, he says, I want you to do three things. And these same three things is what I do with anybody new to recovery. He says, Greg, I want you to stop using drugs and alcohol. Um, we don't drink or use no matter what. Number two, I want you to go to 90 meetings in 90 days. And I said, good, so does the judge. And last but not least, I want you to take boxing lessons. Boxing lessons. 
He's like, yeah, because when you do the first two, you're going to have so much resentment and anger. You're going to have to put it somewhere. Huh. And so when I talk to a young person who I'm mentoring, who I'm sponsoring, I tell them the same thing. We don't drink or use no matter what. We go to 90 meetings in 90 days and take some form of exercise. Sweat that out. You got to get, you got to get it out because it, it, it's part of, of, the, of, the, of the journey. And, um, and before I left his office, he says, you look really scared. I said, I am. I'm facing five years in prison. And he says, I'm going to make a promise to you. Greg, I'm going to do this right. Greg plus drugs and alcohol equals jail. Take drugs and alcohol out of the equation and you won't go to jail. So Mikey and Jason, in 26 years of sobriety, how many times have I been to jail? I'm going to guess a big donut. I'm going to go with zero. I'm going to go with zero. Yes. And so that's another thing I tell people. I say, look, drugs and alcohol plus you equals bankruptcy or bad marriage or something, you know, over here. Take drugs and alcohol out and I'll make you the same promise that that whatever that version of jail is will go away. Um, and so that's my story in terms of how I got sober. And, uh, you know, I'll just shut up for a minute and you guys ask me. <laughs> because, <laughs> because, well, it, it, it's, it, it's interesting you bring that up. I know when I've referred back to some of the writing I did was often talking about alcohol. I, I got arrested twice, once only where I was actually booked and went into a held, holding cell. And I think it was less than 24 hours or something. But the misery of addiction, that prison is far worse than that experience I had in that, that 24 hours of being in there. Um, so it's interesting you talk about that of, you know, incarceration or maybe people that are listening that have a loved one that's struggling with addiction. You don't realize if you need a metaphor, it is yep. a fucking prison. It's a prison yep. in your mind, in the reality that you're living that you can't even connect the dots to. Uh, and you know, it's uh, you, wow. Your story just, I'm still with the, the priest getting the chills <laughs> with, about your that. Stepdad's first sponsor. Yeah. That's, that's just wow. insanity insanity so yeah. when you and what's and what's cool about that is um you know i was raised catholic you know i was raised with the with the god on the white cloud and the white beard and the lightning bolt right oh, yeah and, and and my mom said go to church and and this man of the cloth pointed me to a, a 12-step program that does present you know a higher power you know um you know the universe right and i have a whole different perspective of of, of god and a higher power here's my version of higher power is whatever i put out in the world i get back yeah. And, and, and guess what? There are, there's a sun and a bunch of planets in the air that have not moved in a long time. They, they're in the same orbit for billions of years. <laughs> Someone put them there, right? <laughs> I also yeah. give this to you guys. Think about this. Has man ever been able to conquer mother nature? Have we yeah. ever been able to stop an earthquake, uh, a, a tornado, right? Uh, a, a, a tsunami, right? We can't, right? So there's some force greater than us and whatever that is in star Wars, may the force fucking be with you. Right. You know, I mean, it's like, it's like, it's like there's something out there. Right guys. And so um, I know in my prior life, I was putting out bad juju and guess what? Bad juju came back in my now life. I put out good juju and I, and I am really blessed with a lot of good ju juju coming back to me. Yeah. And it's, it's just a sign that for anyone that's out there struggling that, you know, it's never too late to turn shit around. Not at yep. any point in your life. Not at any point in your life. Um, you were talking about uh, the, the prior to us recording, discovering your it factor. And we were talking about your name champion by definition and, and living up to that. You know, mine's the chance. It's like means lucky or something in French. I don't know. <laughs> I'm but, not lucky. It's, it's Polish. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. but, but you have, a, a you know, the name champion and, yeah. and kind of living up to that. Um, but talk about discovering your it factor and yeah, how it kind so, of related to your name. Yeah. So for, for uh, much of my story is, um, is, you know, you're born with that last name and people, Oh, it's a great last name. I want a name like that. And, and I really put the pressure on myself to live up, to be a champion every day. And it is impossible. It, it's, it, it's these people who have perfectionism problems, you know, I, it, it, you're never going to be perfect and, and trying to live up to that name. um really, um, put me behind the eight ball. And I do think it's part of the reason why I drank and used, um, you know, I wanted to become a loser, you know, this be that, you know, and I certainly became one, you know, become the best one you can, right? Yeah. Right. You know, <laughs> And, 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 um, and so what happened was about five years ago, I, I really um, changed careers and um, was asked to become a recovery coach based upon all my life experiences. And, and I really took, I said, man, what, what is my it factor? 
you know, some people like LeBron James, you know, he has his it factor and Tiger Woods has his app with it factor. Um, what, what is mine? And I, and I remember that people always remember my last name. They never remember my first name, but they're always, remember, there's that champion guy or, or, or champ or whatever. So I thought, okay, that, that's my it factor. But I went and looked it up in, in the Webster's Dictionary. And you know, obviously the first definition is winner, someone who's victorious, right? But then I looked at the second one. And the second definition is someone who champions a cause or is a mentor. And Jason and Mikey, that is me. Uh, if you guys have me, you guys want me to rally around knocking doors down and Carlos's book or your podcast, I'm going to champion your cause. But the other thing that I've done just naturally through all my um, different jobs and careers is I've mentored tons of kids to their first and second job. I have mentored a lot of young people to recovery. And here I am living up finally to that last name champion. It just happens to be the second definition you would find in Webster's Dictionary. So, so God does have a plan for me. And I'm in, I'm in acceptance of that role. And, um, you know, and it comes very easy to me. I, I really do like coaching people. I like mentoring people. Um, I like being what we call a program of attraction. You know, sure. um, as you see over my shoulder here, you see my family and, and some, some accolades here. That's all because of, of my recovery, the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous and, and being in the middle of the boat. I always say, let's get in the middle of the boat. We'll row together and let God be the rudder. Yeah, got to have someone steer in that direction, right? Because yeah. uh, when we chose it, it sure as shit didn't go too well. No. Great. Great. I got to ask, show. I gotta ask yeah. you, what, what, what presented the it factor? Who, who planted that seed? In, like who first taught you about the it factor? Okay, so, so what happened, Mikey? I, I was sitting, uh, I was speaking at an AA meeting uh, five, five years ago. And I was just telling my experience, strength and hope. And I was saying, you know, I told my story that you guys just heard. I told a little bit about my, my um, Hollywood career and working with big brands. I told about um, mentoring a lot of people mm -hmm. and um, uh, the, um, I'm trying to think here. Oh, and then, then I also was uh, able to teach entrepreneurship at USC. And so this woman comes up, she's about seven years old. She kind of looks like a, a female version of Yoda. And she's got, all the she's got all the spirituality about her, right? And I'm looking down at her and, and she's, and she's one of these women who's like four foot nine, but has a ton of energy coming at you. Right. And she says, you should be a recovery coach. And uh, I said, why? She goes, you have all these tools to give away to people, you know? And what I did was um, I went and listened to a podcast uh, on about Steve Jobs. Mm -hmm. And when Steve Jobs was developing his um, companies, Apple and all that stuff, and the, pod, you know, the iPod and the iPad and um, you know, Pixar, he always would ask anybody trying to pitch him an idea, what's your it factor? What distinguishes you away from the rest of the companies or the rest of the people? And I go, what is that it factor? And I started doing research and it really is, when, when companies go up to Silicon Valley and pitch venture capitalists, the venture capitalists will ask, hey, what distinguishes you from the rest of the people I'm seeing for money? What is your it factor? And all I did is take it from a company standpoint, I put it on me because as you know, with Instagram and Facebook, we're all a brand these days. Yeah. And so it was really this little Yoda woman got me going on it. I did a little research with one of these godfathers known as Steve Jobs. And before you know it, um, I put it out there and then uh, TEDx asked, asked me to do a talk on it. And uh, part of that talk you can find on YouTube. That's nice. Cool. Nice. Yeah. I, I asked that because my mom, because I know we're all mama's boys here. And I was like, yeah. please tell me your mom told you about it. In fact, because my mom <laughs> told me about it. Okay. She would always like, that person has the it factor. And I'm like, well, it factor, what does that mean? What are you talking yeah. about? She's like, when they walk into a room, they just have a presence. There's yep. just a presence to them. I don't really know how else to explain it other than the it factor, like that person right there, that person, like there's out of a hundred people, there'll be like five of them who just have this presence that yeah. everybody just kind of like acknowledges for a quick second. That's, some, the, some that's what my mom me, always told me. Yeah, well, it's funny. So if you think about it, that little um, uh, Yoda person, she was, she was kind of an adoptive mom. So, you know, it, mm. it, so a mom did deliver that message. Yeah, but yeah. You, you hit it right on the head, Mikey. A person that jumps out to me with the it factor is the rock. Uh, Dwayne oh, Johnson. Oh, for I'm sure. a huge for sure. fan. Right? right? I mean, like, that's the easiast way to define it. That guy walks sure. in a room and, and it all eyes shift to him. And he has always had that. He has yeah, always sure. had that. Yeah. Absolutely. But, um, 
But what I want to say is we all have a superpower. We all do. And we're put here to, to accentuate that superpower. And a lot of the work that I do in the work I do at Startup Recovery, which is where, um, you know, I have two treatment facilities. Um, they're, they're known as transitional homes. Mm -hmm. I also have a 15-unit a, a apartment building called Startup Apartments. I have two wonderful partners, Jeffrey Van and Patricia Myers. And in a very short amount of time, we built up this nice um, recovery brand um, that delivers on its promise. We want, to, uh, have, we want you to have a transformational experience. We want you to walk in broken, hurt, in pain and shame, and we want you to leave with some tools, some spirituality, and, and a community around you that gets you to allow you to push the reset button on your life. Mm -hmm. and, and, and really, one of the things I work on with people is um, developing what their superpower is, you know? Um, yeah. and, and we live up to that, that tagline I told you guys about shifting addiction, addiction to passion. passion. Yeah. And, and I think that the two of you being sober men right there have, have, have done that shift, you know? Um, you know, Jason, what would I, if I said to you, what, what, you, what would you consider your superpower? I would think being able to communicate with people, conversation. And probably all different types, right? Yeah, yeah. And it was, and that's the irony, you know, as a kid, I was the shy kid, the kid that didn't talk or spoke through uh, character voices or other stuff. And, the, mm -hmm. you know, was uh, better seen, not heard. And then uh, ironically, you know, for over 20 years to make my living freaking talking to people. So um, yeah. I would think that that's it. I, you know, I have a, I'm not afraid of public speaking and, you know, things of that nature, um, you know, clearly sharing my story. <laughs>
I hope I don't see you tomorrow. I hope I don't see you tomorrow. And so in my company, I only had about five or six, maybe 10 people. I do the same thing. I get to hundred million. I go, I hope I don't see you tomorrow. I hope I don't see you tomorrow. Right. Now, you know, they all showed up the next day because none of us won. But, but, <laughs> but you know, you know it, it, it's planting the seed of hope. It's planting the seed of hope. So yep. that's how I made the transition from, from, from mentee to mentor. And, and I just love mentoring people because here's what. I'm going to give you, I, I'm going to show you the mistakes I made so you don't have to. Right. And it's the greatest gift you can, a mentor can do. I'm also going to open up doors that took me 10, 15, 20 years to open, Right. And so suddenly, if you guys say to me, hey, Greg, we have a screenplay. Do you know anybody? Guess what? Uh, we're going to make some calls on my behalf. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to vouch for Mikey and Jason. And you go, meanwhile, if you didn't know me, it would take you a much longer time to get into those doors. So I really think it's, it's, it's let me show you my mistakes. Um, let, me, uh, prevent, uh, let me give you guidance on what you should do. Because a lot of my uh, people I mentor, they have a bunch of projects, right? And what I do is I, I say, okay, let, let's set up all your projects like this. And I go, here's what you need to do. Instead of pushing them all at the same time, do it this way. Get this one done, get this one done, get this one done. And you watch how all seven of them will get done in a timely fashion. And then the last bit is really opening doors and creating access for people. Yeah, you're right. Right. Yep. No, but uh, exactly what we aim to do here, especially if there's people that are still sitting in denial and maybe listen to one of the episodes and go, ah, oh, that, that person's uh, someone I look up to and go, oh, shit, that, their story's me, you yep. know? So pass it along. Another thing that you brought up that I that I liked was uh, the term uh, flatliners in life. And I think it's really important to share because maybe help people, that are, maybe if they're not even in addiction, but like enjoy listening to this podcast, but they're feeling stuck and just like yeah. life is not moving, changing. Yeah. So um, a few years ago, I was sharing from uh, in a very big meeting and I looked around the room and um, and I remember somebody shared about um, being embarrassed about their chaotic life, being in shame of their chaotic life. And I know for me, when I was out there dr uh, drinking and drugging, my life was like this, da, 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 you know, job this, that girl, da, you know, like this, this, da, 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 this. And then when I got into recovery and I found sobriety and I found spirituality and I, I found a, a purpose, uh, my life still had ups and downs for sure. I, I certainly have have weathered some storms. I've gone through a divorce in sobriety. I, I've gone through the, the Alzheimer's death of my mother. Uh, my sister committed suicide. Uh, my oldest daughter had open heart surgery, all while I was sober, right? I've been hired, I've been fired. And, and so my life has continued to do this. And what I wanna tell everybody is that, you know, I have a friend who I grew up with who, he went to the same grade school, he went to the same high school, he went to the same, uh, college all in in San Diego. He married in San Diego, he had his kids in San Diego, and his life has pretty much been in San Diego. And I deem that person to be a flatliner, you know, someone who's just cruising along, right? And what I encourage everybody who's listening today is that embrace your ups and downs, but have the knowledge that if you're on a peak right now, there's a valley is going to come. And if you're down in a valley, you know a peak's going to come. But more importantly, listen to me when I say this, is I'm a lover of music, I'm a lover of movies, and I'm a lover of books. And what I do know in my 52 years is that no book, no song, um, no movie has ever been written about a flatliner. It's always about somebody with an up and down life. So embrace your up and down life. It, 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 makes, you, it makes you have a textured life um, and a story to tell. And, and people, tell your story because... What I have found, and I know what Jason and Mikey have found, is this, is that when we tell our story, a couple of things happen. If we tell a story of, of pain, we cut our pain in half. If we tell a story of joy, we double our joy. But what I love when I tell my story in a room of 12-steppers, I get the nods. Yeah, huh? yeah, yeah. I love the nods, Jason. I love the nods, you know. And so um, it, it, that that's that's how I embrace the creativity that comes out of recovery. I, I think that you guys have put together this little media company with books and podcasts and energy drinks, and it all came out of uh, out of sobriety and clarity, right? Yeah. And and I said to you guys earlier, it, you know, we we used to chase drugs at four a.m. in the morning, 
with yeah. great vigor, right? <laughs> Absolutely. Take that same take that take that same vigor with a good idea and some entrepreneurship behind it, and you you'll make something out of your life. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and is it an example that uh, anyone at any point it's it's not too late. You can turn it around. You, yep. you just you're gonna have to do the work though. Just like Greg said, yeah. if the work was how to get a, another bag or me counting the change just to buy a couple of tall boys, you know, at the end of the night because you're sitting there shaking from the DTs, whatever it is, there you can't get it turned around. It's gonna take the work, but put that mm -hmm. same vigor and passion into that work. Yep. For sure. Uh, so Greg, before we get to, uh, we like to wrap up with some fun, uh, rapid questions. Well, yeah, just questions to answer when, when you uh, give it some thought, mm -hmm. but um, the, tell us a little bit more about the recovery podcast and how people can find you, social media sure. and so on and so forth. So, so what came out of Startup Recovery um, was a coaching curriculum that basically um, does not come out of a book. It comes out of my 26 years of recovery. So um, and, and basically it's called the recovery playbook <laughs> and, and, um, and it, um, you know, it's a bunch of, uh, different things. So you have the, um, the 10 intentions, is this coming up backwards or frontwards? Oh, we can read yeah. it. Frontwards, okay. frontwards. You're it, good. it has the 10 intentions. It has the post-it, the right to write the backpack of shame, shifting addiction, you know, the mantra, the digital scrub, you know, guys, you guys are your phone on you right now. Uh -huh. Yeah. Mikey does. Okay, Mikey, here we, here's the digital scrub. We're going to do a play from it. So what, what this is, this recovery playbook, it's 12 plays. I do it in person with clients, right? But also it can be found online, the recoveryplaybook.com backslash get started. And so Mikey, you and I are going to do a digital scrub right now, okay. right? Now this came about was um, about five years ago. I'm going through my phone looking for a newcomer. His name is Mark. And all of a sudden I come across the name Marnie. Now, Marnie is the girl who broke my heart, put me in a fetal position. I lost 15 pounds in four days. I was calling my mother every 20 minutes, right? But here's this woman who has not been in my life for 15 years. And all of a sudden, all that anxiety came back. Mm -hmm. And I'm looking at the phone going, well, why is she in my phone? I'm married, two kids. I, I'm never going to speak to this woman again. So I delete her. And then I begin to go through the phone and I go, oh, yeah, that guy's a jerk. I don't need this guy. And I began doing what I call a digital scrub, Mikey. So what I want you to do is go through your phone and anybody who's given you anxiety or maybe has done a bad business deal, or more importantly, Jason, if it's a, if it's a woman with, um, let's say, Tiffany Vegas or Stephanie Santa Barbara, you might want to get rid of those. <laughs> I swear I have names like that in my phone. <laughs> you, you fucking nailed him right there. I swear I do. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Mikey, this, is oh, Mikey, Mikey, this is part of the digital scrub. Mikey, Mikey, this is part of the digital scrub. This this right. is this is this is this is getting over to the good side. So uh, so we want to get I, rid uh, of I, I don't have that anymore because I've turned my, my man whore ways around in that one. But boy, yeah. when I was drinking, but, there was. Right. So so yeah, any any woman with the last name with the, with a city, you know, is someone or like you the restaurant get rid of. or place you met them yeah, at yeah, years yeah, ago, yeah. you know. Totally, yeah. <laughs> You got it, Mikey. So <laughs> Kim and, Blonde, and, and, Kim Burnett. <laughs> hey, Jason, sure, Mikey's going right, to Mikey's make, hey, we did another hour of the show for this one. <laughs> yeah, no, right. no, Hang no. on, don't go anywhere yet. Let me, <laughs> let me read some names. No, <laughs> no, no, so, you, so you get what I'm saying, Mikey. Absolutely. So what happens is, is much of what the recovery playbook, guys, is, is, is I'm sober, now what? It's 12 lessons after you've gotten sober to keep mm. you sober. <clears throat> um, it's career advice. It's life advice. Um, it's getting shame out. Um, it's understanding our core character defects, right? And, and really working on ourselves in a very positive manner. So the reason why I did the digital scrub there was for two reasons. One, I don't want to. I don't want that anxiety to happen anymore, right? But also, from a from a karma standpoint, guys, we're carrying these people around with us. Yeah. You know, and I know you guys are big spiritual and feel the vibe, guys. We don't want these people around anymore. The digital scrub can work in a couple of ways. I, I usually do it in three ways. I say, we're gonna scrub the phone. Then we're gonna go on Instagram and Facebook and we're gonna get rid of our frenemies, right? People who we went to high school with and you think you're friends with them, but they're really jerks, right? Mm -hmm. And then we're gonna go on our LinkedIn page and build out our brand, rebrand yourself um, to what you want the public to be. So it's, it's clean off the phone, Go into Facebook and Instagram and take away the frenemies and then, and then on LinkedIn, clean up your brand. And that, that's just one play of the recovery playbook. 
Um, again, it's the recoveryplaybook.com backslash get started. But um, yeah, we, we are finding great um, success in that because it really is life lessons, Jason and Mikey. It's, you know, I didn't mean to put Mike in the spot, but guess what? He's going to feel a whole lot lighter when he gets rid of some of those um, people. No, no, you're not putting me on the spot at all. I, I look forward to doing it. And spe- I just added you on Instagram, by the way. I'll delete yeah. everybody else. <laughs> I'll, I'll add you, but I'll delete everybody else. For the most part, all the people that like, you know, like the bad relationships and stuff, I already have them blocked and deleted. So we're already a step ahead there. But I'm definitely seeing some names that I'm like, I don't mm-hmm. talk to this person. Like, yeah. I, yeah. you know what I mean? Like, that's, yeah. So I'm, I'll, I'm definitely going to do that. I will. You have my word. <laughs> Good, Mike. And my, my, my wife has me do something. Uh, she goes, if she, I want you to walk in the closet, and if you haven't worn it in two years, you're going to get rid of it. Yeah. 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 You know what? I'm bad so, about that. My parents, they're both pack rats, man. They're, I stay, they're borderline hoarders. So I'm the complete opposite of that. If I haven't worn this in a while, I'm just goodwill bag goodwill bag like i just throw all my stuff in there i've, I've had these shoes forever i'm not gonna wear them goodwill so. well and that's that's a good lesson too because i definitely found that i became a pack rat and i have to become a minimalist because if i have too much shit in front of me i, I get overwhelmed and i've got to pay attention to it all and and no one can do that no one can yep you're right and it's and funny um, you bring up the clothes thing because uh, and the dwayne the rock johnson they I'm a huge pro wrestling fan, so I got into him when he started the movies, the yeah. whole thing, and I got lots of his stuff and was doing the cleaning out and purging of things, and I was like, I can't get rid of that. That's my rock shirt. I've had that for 15 years. You know, it's like, oh, there's well, some yeah, shit. I, I, and I, and I definitely have old T-shirts from college that, that, are, that are nostalgia, but they go into a bin, they go in the closet, you know, and, and when I pass away, my girls are going to go through it and go, what in the hell do you keep this for? You know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> so, all right. So I, I think guys, you have some random um, um, uh, spitfire yep. questions you're going to throw out at me. Yep. Yes, we do. I'll go ahead and Just kick it. it off. So Greg, if they were to make a movie about you, who would you want to play as yourself? What actor would you cast to play you? Bradley Cooper. Bradley Cooper. Uh, hey, go with the Academy Award winner. Uh, favorite curse word? Motherfucker. <laughs> nice. That's a good one. That two, is that two or one? <laughs> that, hey, still, it still qualifies. Okay. Okay. Um, if you can have dinner with anybody dead or alive, anybody you want in the whole entire world, dead or alive, who would it be? Um, guys, I have to tell you a story because... Um, this fits perfectly. So sure, th- sure. this question was asked to me 20 years ago. And I said, and me being kind of a, a self-centered guy, I said, um, you know, I would like to have dinner with Mother Teresa, Princess Diana, and Christy Turlington. That way I have Mother Teresa, the spiritual figure. I have Princess Diana, my, pr- my princess, and then I have Christy Turlington, my supermodel. Now here's the crazy part. I said that and a week later, Mother Teresa died and Princess Diana was killed in the tunnel. Oh, and wow. my and the person who asked me a question comes over to my desk and goes, we better get Christy Turlington on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we should skip that one. <laughs> so, yeah. No, actually, here, here's, here's who I'd like to have dinner with, Paul Newman. I, I, I really oh, yeah. love Paul Newman's life. I, I think he's one of the greatest Americans. Um, what he did with his um, persona and, and Newman's own um, Academy Awards, uh, race car driver, a handsome devil, uh, loyal to the same woman for over 50 years is, is that that's my that's who i need to be doing dinner with yeah that's great Paul we, i love it we should contact his people <laughs> Paul <Newman's not> alive, <laughs> he, he already passed he already yeah, passed no, yeah um uh, favorite hobby favorite hobby uh so here so what's funny of hobbies uh, jason is um when i work with people i say hey what'd you do before drugs and alcohol what'd you do for joy and when that, when that question was asked to me, I said, well, I, I love body surfing. I love skateboarding. And I love mint chocolate chip ice cream from, from Baskin Robbins. Okay? Three out of three, dude. Three <laughs> so, out of three. So, Mikey, here's the deal. You're going to come down to LA and we're going to go do this stuff. So Let's here's the deal. do it, man. So, so here's what's crazy, Jason, is that um, I, I skateboard with my two daughters. I body surf. And guess what? Just last night, we went to Baskin Robbins for mint chocolate chip ice cream. So the, the same joy and hobbies I had as a 10-year-old, I still now have as a 52-year-old. So that's what I do now. 
That's let, me, awesome. let me touch I'll, on this. I'll have to skip out on the skateboard part because I'll fall on my fucking face, let, but I'll bring a bike. Let me touch on this. When I go to the beach and we do go on the water, it's not surfing, it's boogie boarding, it's body surfing. Yeah. We just had a past guest on our show who had this mint chocolate chip cake. And I'm like, oh my gosh, she brought us a pie. I'm like, you need to bring us that cake because I love mint chip. And I skateboarded for 16 years. It's the biggest passion I've ever had in my entire life. Greg, we just became best friends. I'm going to hashtag you BFF on, on Instagram today. Do it, man. Do, I'll uh, do the same. <laughs> uh, all right, Greg, one more here before we ask you to leave uh, everyone with some words of uh, inspiration, encouragement. Uh, what is something about you that people would be surprised to learn? Um, that my first job out of college I was a deep sea fisherman in Alaska. Oh, wow. Be damn. Yeah. I, 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 uh, I, I drove up to Seattle with a friend who was going to go deep sea fishing. Why I got, I took a job at a, at a TV station. And when I drove up there, the job went away and he goes, Hey, what are you doing for the next three months? I said, nothing. He's like, let's go deep sea fishing. So I got on a trawler and we went up to, to uh, uh, a place called Dutch Harbor, which is on the very end of the Aleutians. Yep. And your boy was out in 50 and 100 foot waves. Um, I almost died four times. Um, but, you know, it, again, my ism said, go do this, you know, because I certainly there was there was booze on the on the boat. There was some pot on the boat. And I certainly was checking out. But I think people will be shocked that I was out in a, on a in the Alaskan fishing waters uh, trawling for three months. That's cool. Wow, that That's cool. Awesome. We'll have to hear about that more some other time. Anything yeah. else, Mike, before we leave Greg with the final words? No, I think that's it, man. Let's get the final words going. Greg, if you could uh, lend some advice to those out there listening that are either um, seeking recovery, in recovery, or have a loved one um, that is, or even just great life knowledge in, in general, um, what can you share? Well, a couple of things. I'm going to say three things that, and I like quick phrases. I, I say, I think the most um, three deadly words uh, in recovery are, I got this. Mm -hmm. um, everybody that I know that ends up in a grave or in rehab or a, a, a retread has uttered those words like, I got this. You don't, you don't got shit. Uh, the disease of alcoholism addiction is a 900 pound gorilla and it's not done with you until, you, until it decides it's done with you. The other thing that I would say is these other five words, I stopped going to meetings. I stopped going to meetings. Whenever I hear someone come back into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, they utter those five words, I stopped going to meetings. And lastly, um, for me, um, what I've learned as a man in recovery is we suit up and we show up, which means when you guys ask me to be on a podcast, I'm gonna be there. Mikey, if you, if you said to me tomorrow, I have a friend who is in desperate help, can you help me intervene? I'm gonna be there. Because here's why. That's what happened for me. People suited up and showed up for me. So I'm going to suit up and show up for you. It's, it's the greatest step we have is, is the one of service. Mm -hmm. and, and we get to use our superpowers that God has given us or redirected to us um, to go suit up and show up. And so mm -hmm. what's crazy about this is that I've lectured at USC and UCLA and Arizona State, and I'll get emails from somebody who's not in recovery. These are just college kids. And I always end my speech with, hey, I got a motto for you. You always want to suit up and show up. And so that, that has became sort of a, 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 a ringing of the bell, um, both in life, both in entrepreneurship, and certainly in recovery. I can, I can